any sound is, is a complicated object. I plan on doing sonification of just about everything I've ever come across. There's nothing else uh, that sounded like the blues before it arrived. Sound is a fundamental excitation of We're trying to understand the amount of treble and the amount of bass of this light left over from the Big Bang. We are taking piano lessons from uh, students from our music department. I think that was our first lesson. We wanted, we showed her our house, and she goes, "Oh, this place will be really great for a salon." We have these uh, musicians who come and play this most outrageous stuff that I would never have heard, and if I had been in a formal setting, I would have been very irritated or whatever, because I don't get anything out of it. But in a small venue of, of a living room, sometimes you laugh, and it's okay to laugh, that you wouldn't have been able to laugh in a formal setting. So it's a much more approachable way of finding something out about this. And then after you've been exposed to this outrageous stuff for a while, you realize it's not so outrageous, and you begin to... Start seeing something beyond uh, just being irritated at that. That's a little bit, in some sense, discoveries in science as well. You know, people come up with a very, very uh, creative new idea. That makes whole entire science community very uncomfortable because they have learned in one way, now somebody bringing totally different way of looking at things. With music, there isn't necessarily a provable right answer. Like, what makes a piece excellent? What makes it dazzling? What makes it special? What makes it sparkle? Uh, can we prove it? Can I prove to you that the G-sharp was the note that made it special? You know, this is very elusive. But when you hear a great composition, the Goldberg Variations, for instance, of Johann Sebastian Bach, you can feel the, the perfection in the great works. I feel that, aside from music, my greatest inspiration for many, many years is nature. From the macro to the micro, there are so many musical relationships. In DNA, we have our history and our present and our future. You know, these things are coded. Now, this is quite musical. The idea that you would have a line of music, and then you would have the spiraling line of music, and then you would separate those two lines of music and build complementary strands to each of those, and then those divide, and so on and so forth, and you suddenly have all these musical lines. In my research, we're trying to study the light left over from the Big Bang. Over 90% of it is still in this form of this microwave radiation now. That's this light left over from the Big Bang. And you see this series of tones, which are literally sound waves in the very early universe that have created this scale and this characteristic pattern that you can see in this microwave map of the sky. The South Pole is the best place in the world to make these observations because of its unique environment. It's the driest air in the world. Uh, it's also extremely stable when the sun goes down and it's down for six months. And it's sort of like a, giving us a standard ruler uh, for the universe. We're actually able to map out how much the universe has been expanding. Microbes are in every environment, and they drive the biogeochemical cycles of the planet Earth. The amount of data that's generated in a microbial ecology experiment is vast. There needs to be a way to present, analyze this data in a meaningful way. One of the ways is uh, sonification of data. Uh, microbial bebop is the sonification of microbial data. The goal of this approach is to use some of the principles of melody, chord progression, and harmony to identify the underlying relationships between multiple data elements within a, a large, complicated data set. 
the exercise of taking a data set, thinking about it in a fundamentally different way to come at data from different directions uh, helps me get a deeper understanding of the data that I handle. Music itself, like a language, is not something that you inherit genetically. Uh, you have to learn it. Well, one of the, the common misconceptions um, people who don't listen to blues very often have is that it is sad music. But in fact, it's actually just the opposite. It's meant to cure the blues. And it was developed in circumstances in the Deep South during the Jim Crow period. And then as part of the Great Migration, six million African Americans moved out of the South up into northern uh, cities. And they carried the music to these urban contexts. It was transformed by amplification and then the use of amplification to do all sorts of really novel things with the music. It struck me that there were a lot of students uh, who passed through the university spending four years in the library and never really understanding what, uh, what kind of cultural treasures were around them. So that's when I decided to design this course on Chicago blues that I teach. It seems to me that it's really important for the students and the scholars who work here to have some appreciation of uh, what their neighbors have contributed to life in general in the city and in the country and to the world, really.